salutations and welcome or welcome back to my channel my name is Kidology and I make videos about anything and everything to do with modern society and today we're talking about something that has been on my mind for the past week because apparently college students can't read books anymore now there always seems to be a new moral panic around young people not being able to do something every other week so I don't tend to take them too seriously but this one hits a little bit differently not just because I've been seeing the stories surrounding especially elementary school students and high schoolers but also because there's a bit of a personal story behind it for me. Now you see, when I was in high school and in college, that is from age 17 to 18 in the UK, we are in college, I was an avid reader. When I was in high school, I could very easily get through two to three books a week. Now just for the sake of comparison, I read Ulysses in just over two weeks and even though I didn't understand three quarters of it, it was well worth the wait. It was well worth the struggle because now I would say it's taken me just under a month to get through hard times. And this is Charles Dickens' shortest novel. And in making notes for this video, I didn't really have to think very long and hard as to why this is. That is why it now takes me a month to get through books that I would have considered fairly easy, very easy not just to get through, but very easy to comprehend and to process. Firstly, when I was in high school, I had no friends. There were no distractions as a result. I didn't have peer pressure or the pressure of others not to read and to do other things. I was a one woman show and therefore books were my friends. Guys, I'm editing this right now and I say that so seriously, it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> I don't know why I was so serious. I'm so sorry. I'm so, it, 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 it was not that deep. But I, what I was basically saying was that I didn't have the kinds of peer pressure to conform to trends or to follow trends or to do things. And so I was just on my own mission in life. And this is very much a reason why, especially as I say later on, there's quite a gender gap in reading, especially with boys, greater peer pressure, greater need to conform to things. So yes, I'm sorry. I was so serious. <laughs> Importantly, I also didn't have a smartphone. I know this is shocking and I can't believe it myself because social media is my job now, but I didn't have a smartphone until I was in my early 20s. So I've only had a smartphone now for, I got my first smartphone when I was 22, 23, I believe. I think 22. And I sort of like started YouTube like almost immediately. I think getting a smartphone was very influential in getting me watching YouTube for the first time. I did not watch YouTube before I I was in my 20s. So that was indicative as to why I was reading so much. And so as a result, at university, I did not have a smartphone in my life. And on the topic of university, I think that was also so indicative as to why I read so much. And I'd say that the main explanation was that reading had real tangible value. It had outer worldly value. I was essentially getting a student loan to read books. I was valued for reading books. I wanted to and had the dream of becoming an academic and was therefore in line to get paid to read books that I found important and pleasurable. The little bubble that I was in valued reading and therefore I read. And so reading books and being intellectual about books wasn't something that I was just gifted with or bestowed with or just able to do. It was something which I cultivated over many years and was very much down to my circumstance, my very personal and particular circumstance, which inadvertently valued reading. I had the time time and the patience to read very complex, difficult world literature. And as I said, my personal circumstance was primed to make me an avid reader. And I think based on that, that is why now I find it so difficult to read like I used to. I'm anxious all the time. I have a smartphone and my job is social media. And I think importantly, as I got older, I realized probably a bit too late that beyond university, society doesn't value reading. What is very much valued are books that appeal to the masses, which can, in many circumstances, be works of literature. That is books that are very well written, that have qualitative value, I would say. Books that have characters that you can find, I would say, a kind of philosophical value and meaning in, who are complex and difficult to decipher. Works that are open to multiple views of interpretation. Interpretations that not only add to the value of the work itself, but ultimately, I think, 
think are valuable throughout time because they can be interpreted in different ways. But as I said, modern society doesn't value reading. It values the franchises that can be created, exploited, and profited off of from reading. And in fact, when you look at the franchises, the reading and the books themselves are actually secondary to everything else that is created around it, in my humble opinion. Nobody would be impressed to see on my CV that I'd read City of God Against the Pagans during my summer holiday rather than taking unpaid work experience. And this is a key reason, I think, as to why there is also such a gender gap when it comes to reading. Boys and men read far less than women, and I think this is very much down to the fact that, especially for men and for boys, reading isn't valued in the kind of culture and societal upbringing and rearing of young boys. Fathers are less likely to read to their sons relative to their daughters. And also for girls, reading is very much a way to escape from being unable to do things that boys are allowed to do as boys. Reading is a way to be adventurous, a way to essentially have the freedom that is otherwise not permitted to young girls in the same way or comparatively. And this is the foundation on which I'd like to start this discussion into why young people, that is students, college students, and young adults, are not able to read full books. Specifically, I'd argue not full books in as much as not being able to read what would be called and what I have very loosely described as literary works or books that have value. And of course, in all of this, value is very much up to interpretation. But just like books are invaluable to exercising the most complex of organs, I think fitness is invaluable to exercising not just your body, but your mind. Now, brethren, I have a personal trainer who is invaluable, not just to my fitness journey, but to keeping my mind and my body in harmony. But I recently moved away and that's put me in a bit of limbo because not only do I potentially have to find a new personal trainer but also maybe a new gym but I live in the middle of nowhere I have yet to find a gym and I am panicking and on top of that I'm looking after a sphinx kitten which has bound me to my apartment I cannot leave she's absolutely adorable but brethren brethren my fitness journey has stalled in ways that I had not intended and that has been affecting me mentally more than I would have imagined as I said I am in a quagmire. Or at least I was. And I give you that palaver of my backstory because I know how many of us want to exercise, have fitness goals and aspirations that we can't meet because of life. And that's why, brethren, I think that Trainwell is an indispensable app for anybody who has fitness aspirations and goals that you need to meet, but you also need to balance with your personal life and situation. Now, Trainwell is way more than just a fitness app. It basically combines your personal life situation with an ex expert personal trainer. And in this, you get a really good recipe of what I would call personalization and accountability. Now, your personal trainer will customize your workout plans based on your goals. And the onboarding process of being matched with your personal trainer couldn't be easier nor more individualized. I'm able to choose not just my fitness goals, whether it be to specifically enjoy exercising or learning how to age well to improve health or build strength, but I can select my preferred training trainer's identity, whether they have experience with LGBTQ plus folk, their experience with plus size individuals, with mothers, with homeschooling, you name it. I also really appreciate how you can actually select how your trainer communicates with you. All the way back in the day, I used to find one of my PTs just a little bit too unempathetic when I was struggling, especially with personal stuff. And this kind of technology would have helped me so much back then. Sometimes we just need a loving hand from our PT, am I right? And it is no surprise to me why train well makes it nine times more likely for you to achieve your health goals. Because having somebody who intimately understands you, your needs and your situation, as well as what equipment you may or may not have on hand is truly indispensable to really easing so much pressure of having to get to a gym or having to use particular equipment when you just do not have it, when you do not know how to use it. And on this note, just because your personal trainer is virtual, it doesn't mean that they are not real. This is a genuine individual, a genuine human being. I, for instance, was matched with my personal trainer and I can read everything about her. I know everything about her and I can be in constant communication with her as well, which is so, so helpful. If you're wondering why fitness has been so hard and why a cat tree has suddenly appeared behind me, 
Her name's Maple. And you know, brethren, fitness has done more for my mental health than anything, quite frankly. And I am so relieved that I have a solution to my adorable, very adorable little predicament. So if you, like me, are stuck at home with a kitten who can't be left alone for more than half an hour a day, or you just want to incorporate accountability and personalized exercise into your life and into your wellness and fitness journey, then I implore you to use my link down below to get yourself a 14 day free trial to train well. That is 14 days completely free with your new expert personal trainer. Thank you so very much to train well for sponsoring this video. And now let's have a discussion into the various theories that have emerged as to why people can no longer read full books. But first, I'm sorry. Um, you have to look at this cat. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm trying to become a cat person. I'm just so anxious around a cat. If any of you have cats, especially kittens, especially a sphinx kitten who are very clingy. I know sphinx cats are very different to other cat breeds. If any of you have any suggestions, any are welcome because my anxiety right now is through the roof. Now, as I said, many college professor has come out, especially in recent weeks, as to speculate as to why students cannot read full books. And this isn't just college students, but students at some of the most elite universities in the world. For instance, at Columbia and at Oxford. I also love how on r slash academia, there's a TLDR on this article exploring why elite college students can't read full books anymore. Now, most of the professors who were commenting about this were mainly blaming smartphones and especially social media and doom scrolling. Young people's attention spans aren't where they used to be and increasingly, anxiety and mental health issues are affecting younger and younger people, specifically since the pandemic. How can adults, let alone children and young people, read entire books for pleasure when anxiety and depression and mental health issues are crippling more and more people by the day? How can Charles Dickens compete with, I don't know, sidemen when the latter offers a low investment, quick and easy escape from reality? Now, other professors are going as far as to blame diversity and the greater inclusion of disadvantaged and underprivileged children in especially trying to get into universities, that is in the administration process. So in short, the argument is that in order to accommodate state educated students, that is students who come from schools that don't have the resources nor the time to delve into complex, difficult and lengthy literature, these schools and their needs have now set the standard for everybody. Now tell me that a stuffy-nosed Oxford professor didn't say this, but putting some of the elitism in this argument aside, I do think that this raises a very interesting argument and point. Standardized reading comprehension tests, for instance, are used throughout state schools in order to measure a student's reading level. And yet importantly, these tests can't actually evaluate or assess what the student or whether the student has actually learned anything. That is whether they have developed or engaged with their critical thinking in order to comprehend the text in front of them. The written passages that are used for these tests are completely removed from their context. A very, very difficult, important context that is often actually is, in fact, indicative and essential to critical thinking, to honing into particular skills and traits that are very noticeably missing from our day-to-day -day life. Patience, a willingness to read something over and over and over again in order to understand it, an appreciation that there is no quick fix to understanding something or to engaging with something. And because of this, these kinds of tests have really decentivized teachers and educators from assigning entire texts and entire books to students. There isn't an incentive in schools to read whole texts, let alone complex literature. And as a result, many teachers actually opt to assign and read short informational passages, which optimally train students for their standardized reading comprehension tests. And this whole development has ironically been dubbed the of mice and men effect, whereby students, at least in the UK, are assigned of mice and men instead of the grapes of wrath, just because of the popularization and the greater incentive to read shorter, easier texts relative to the latter. All of which is the result of standardized testing and preparing 
preparing students for their standardized tests. And I think this is important in the discourse, which I have seen a lot of on especially TikTok, namely parents blaming teachers for the fact that their children cannot read and vice versa. There seems to be no end in sight as to who is pointing the finger at who when it comes to children not being able to read. I'm glad I'm not the only one noticing that a lot of the issues we're having with kids and the educational system are coming from the home. Literally the calls coming from inside the house, the parents. The parents themselves reported reading less, having a more negative attitude around reading. And of course, all these stats just weren't looking great when we started to compare them to other like developed nations that we usually chart with. It's always interesting to me to see when I work with kids because a lot of people will incorrectly place the blame on technology and iPad kids, right, and things like that. But at the end of the day, the parents are the ones controlling this technology and giving their kids the access to it. So if the parents aren't also giving them books and enforcing reading, then that's where we start to see these issues arise. Teachers have to keep at the forefront standardized testing and making sure that their students are prepared for it. Whereas on the flip side, parents obviously in their own time do not have either the time nor the incentive to teach their children how to read full books. I have yet to come across a modern parent who sits their child down with a book and says that they have to read that book or else, unless that book was assigned homework. If y'all are the parents who are doing that please let me know how that is going because I have been looking for examples of this of parents actually making their children read books like books that aren't just children as in you know kindergarten children reading books but actually their children who have smartphones actually sitting them down and saying that you have to read a book and whether that is even possible gentle parenting is all the rage right now so I really don't know if that is actually possible but if it is I'd be very curious to know but with all of that being said I do think that there is more to consider here. And I think this relates to a very interesting, I would say sort of personal theory of mine. Theory makes it sound way too like important than it is, but it, it relates to an important sort of thought that I've been having as to why not just young people can't read full books anymore, but also as to why these young people are also opting increasingly not to have children, at least in the West. And by this, I mean that one in four millennials and Gen Zers are choosing to be voluntarily childless. 44% of non-parents ages 18 to 49 say it is not too likely or not likely at all they will have children someday. That's up seven percentage points from 2018 survey. Reasons for not having children range from medical and financial to concerns about the state of the world and the environment. And most simply say they just don't want to. And so when you change the norm from it is good to have kids to we are utterly indifferent as to whether people have kids. What you end up with is a dying civilization. And that is precisely what we are seeing today. Firstly, it isn't that children and young adults aren't reading books. Book talk, for instance, is booming, and I will be getting back to that momentarily. Inasmuch as children and adults are choosing not to read literature. So why is this? As I said, book talk is booming at the moment, but you are not likely to see anybody caring for the works of Jane Austen. Inasmuch as caring for, I would say the aesthetic of Jane Austen, which is far better and easily executed through the likes of Bridgerton. Bingle bongle, dingle dangle, yickety doo, yickety da, ping pong, lippy tappy too ta. I am currently reading Pride and Prejudice for the first time. And while part of me is enjoying it, why are there so many fucking characters and why don't they indicate when they're saying what they're saying? Like there are full on three way conversations and it doesn't say who is saying what. I cannot be expected to keep track of this. Throw he said, she said at the end of the sentence every now and again. Also, they refer to the moms and like everyone is Miss Bennett. Like Elizabeth's mom and Elizabeth and Jane, like Miss Bennett, Miss Bennett. Can we just say their first name, please? Cause who are we referring to? I'm not far enough along to know who is saying what based on just what they're saying. But I will say that I'm kind of having a good time with this. It's pretty dense, but I didn't know that there were short chapters in this book. Like I'm already on chapter 16. What do you mean by that? Look at how far I am. But also the words, there's like no space in between the words. It's borderline Bible type of spacing. Um, but let me know like hacks is to understand this, please. Cause I want to enjoy this a lot and I'm enjoying it mediocre. 
and on we go mediocre level twilight is for instance and in my opinion basically romeo and juliet for young millennials and gen zers with however important and major differences firstly i think just objectively i i, I don't even think that we can actually debate this um shakespeare was objectively just a better writer than stephanie myers he was writing plays completely different context and sort of comparing the two is nonsensical but just sort of like looking just objectively at the use of language and literary devices it's kind of just it's it's just obvious um, I, 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 sorry if of course anybody any offense bizarre comparison to make anyway i, I don't think it's a good comparison but yes uh, <laughs> but i think far more importantly than that is that secondly we live in an age of hyper individualism where relatability is king and because our age has a far greater emphasis on relatability it is inevitable that our books and what we read also will as well as the demand for what we read to be relatable it is far easier for teenage girls and young women to relate to a 2000s bella swan than to a 14th century juliet just like it is far easier for young adults to relate to a diverse cast of bridgerton characters or the modern issues explored by colleen hoover than to dickensian characters and their very particular victorian era quandaries oh i have not used that word out loud in my life that um <clears throat> that felt unnatural <laughs> and even though every single video that i see about colleen hoover is a negative one is a very very critical one for very understandable reasons i do think that this really does represent something commendable higher literacy rates have evolved reading from a luxury elite pastime into something that is being readily enjoyed by the masses that is dictated by the masses and as a result, the masses are going to dictate what is popular when it comes to literature. And as a further result, the masses are going to typically be interested in literature that is not only relatable to the most people, but importantly, the masses are going to be interested in books that most people can understand. Enter the TikTokification of lit, as I would call it. Because without this, I cannot finish it. Why the f***? Everything I read is a flashback. I don't give a f about your previous life. I really f don't. I just want you to get to f***ing ice court and I just want to read action, action, action. I don't care what you did as a child. Just get on with the f***ing story because I cannot, I cannot take it. What's going on? What's happening? Why are there so many fucking characters? Can we just say their first name, please? I didn't know that there were short chapters in this book, but also the words, there's like no space in between the words. It's borderline Bible type of spacing. Let me know like hacks is to understand this, please. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Now everybody's ganging up against me. For what? What the fuck did I do? And I think a very good demonstration of how reading has at least now evolved from even something that is increasingly enjoyed by the masses into something that is very much in line with an aesthetic more so than a pastime from dark academia to smut accounts reading is now being associated with the dialogue and nothing else there are literally tiktoks telling people what classics are just not worth the time and i totally get that this is a personal opinion that is classics i don't think are worth the time but when you say that you will not elaborate hashtag book talk hashtag dark academia aesthetic hashtag bookworm aesthetic aesthetic that is worrisome dialogue is difficult to write but it is most definitely not difficult to read it doesn't require critical thinking skills it doesn't require patience especially a long-term cultivation of patience and this is why for instance it is very noticeable in a lot of modern literature that i read that the dialogue content in a book really has increased relative to the old literature and classics that i read it actually takes me quite a while to adjust between the two when I'm reading something modern relative to reading something that would be considered old or world literature. It is very noticeable when I, for instance, was reading Sally Rooney and then I switched over to reading The God
gospel according to Jesus Christ by Sadamajo. And it took a while to really adjust to them. And it was a stark representation of how the mass mediafication of literature has really influenced how books are written, how greater access to reading has changed how authors obviously inevitably approach writing their books. Sally Rooney was far easier to get through and a far more pleasurable, that is immediately pleasurable experience of a quick, a quick fix, a quick hit, if you can call it that. And because we live in this kind of world and this kind of literary world, it is also no wonder to me why increasingly students, that is college students at Columbia, have actually said that Percy Jackson is their favorite work of literature. That is literature students at Columbia University cite Percy Jackson as their favorite work of world literature. Now the analytical side of me can see why this is based on everything that I've just said, but the more pessimistic and cynical side of me is troubled by this. Very, very troubled by this. The mass appeal of Rick Royden's Percy Jackson is understandable to me relative to say the appeal of Dostoevsky's Prince Moishkin or Alyosha Karamazov. And as I said, this is very understandable. The writing is more digestible, the context is far more understandable and importantly, fantastical. You do not need an historical nor a philosophical understanding of imperial Russia in order to understand what is going on. But for Columbia literature students to be citing Percy Jackson is interesting. And it's interesting because of what I said before as to one of the many reasons why I think young people are opting not to have children. When it comes to young people talking about the books that really impacted them when they were younger, most will cite Harry Potter or other works of fantastical children's literature, such as Percy Jackson for young adults. And when I go onto Reddit, most people speak about these books and the impact that they had in their childhood as a form of escape from their childhood. Not a form of escape in and of itself, but as a form of escape from childhood. And this is very interesting to me. Having children is very, very difficult. And in our modern society, there's absolutely no consensus yet on how to rear, let alone how to educate children. In many respects, modern education has remained somewhat paralyzed in its 19th century archetype. And as writer Lucy Mangan recently wrote, nothing in in short, in modern life is conducive to maximizing the potential of children. You barely get enough time to love them. And as a result, this has created, I would say, a perfect storm and environment for unschooling to boom in popularity yet again. So it's true. My son cannot read at age six. This is going to allow his creativity to flow, letting children be children and not setting them in front of a desk or a piece of paper or a book for eight hours a day is the best way to get their creativity flowing. And I think it has also created a perfect environment for voluntary childlessness to emerge. Most young millennials and Gen Zers can remember or know that their later childhood, which for my generation at least involved growing up very much so with smartphones, was probably no picnic. Now I have yet to meet a fellow Gen Zer who hasn't gone to one of the top private schools in the UK who told me that their childhood was a positive, uplifting, and affirmative experience, both at home with their parents and in education. Most point to isolation, to either having parents that were working too much and that they didn't see enough, and especially escaping into the world of Hogwarts or into online forums, which offered ample opportunity for idealization. And this, for me, is one of the reasons why I really do think young people are choosing not to have children. I think this is an open secret of voluntary childlessness, if you will, mainly because a lot of these fantastical worlds and alternative realities that we escape into as children often have very positive and nostalgic connotations. And I think because it is an escape, we block out that which we are escaping from or that which we escaped from. I know that now when I look at my childhood, when I just look at it without actually 
really thinking and delving into it in therapy specifically that all I see and all I think of is Meryl Streep and how happy Meryl Streep made me. I don't think of why Meryl Streep made me happy because that is a very, very uncomfortable, very harrowing thing to think about. And as I said, I really do think that this speaks to one of the reasons why many young people are choosing not to have children in modern societies. Not many people really know not how to be parents, but how to be good parents, better parents, especially in a modern world that doesn't make that prospect obviously or viably possible. And just like modern schooling, that is the structure and institution of modern schooling and everything that it is directed toward, namely standardized testing in most cases, doesn't give children the tools, the time, or the value to read long, full books and complex literature. It doesn't surprise me that young adults don't have the tools to do so as adults. And this is why I think so many children and young people don't choose to cultivate the art of reading full and difficult books. An art which requires deep concentration, it requires patience and skills that are not at all valued by our modern life and society. I got something to say about that article that says students don't and can't and won't read a book at elite colleges. Well, maybe the elite colleges are getting the kids who have been pushed the hardest. In these APs and honors courses, they teach to the test. And the test is some sort of bogus standardized tests. They're not reading, they're not having discussions, they're not really engaging and learning. And that's not the teacher's fault. We've, we've basically asked them not to teach anymore. And as for parents, give me a break. All they care about is that Johnny take senior high school calculus in sixth grade so he can get into the best college possible. That's not learning. That's not caring about your kid. That's not worrying about whether they can think or read. You just want them to go to college, major in business and get a good job. So it's no surprise if they can't read a book. Plus we got the internet and real good TV make school less boring, give them some good books. But now I feel like I've been analytical a bit too much. I would like to move on to a more, this is problematic sort of tone in this latter part of the video, because I do most definitely see problems with what I see transpiring with headlines that shout that students cannot read full books anymore, because I don't think that these are just sensationalist headlines. I do think this speaks to an issue, which I see in a particular community of book talk called smut talk but just a quick cat cam to cleanse the palate um <clears throat> So modern society doesn't value maximizing the full potential of children. It doesn't value the skills required to meaningfully engage with literature. It doesn't value leisure time that isn't monetizable or able to be made into some form of content. And it doesn't value education. Gee, I wonder why students at Columbia and Oxford and other elite institutions can't read full books. And I wonder why Smut Talk has 2 billion hits on TikTok. Now, I want to talk about Smut, mainly because I think think its popularity and especially its boom since the pandemic really represents something that has happened to reading as of late. And this is basically what I mean. This is literally a popular form of TikTok on Smut Talk that is essentially a cheat sheet. This is so you can skip to the chapters with because why read the book? Why immerse yourself in the story when you're just there to get off? Now, for me personally, Smut Talk represents the downside of the mass mediafication and TikTokification of reading, as well as the consequences of our society's devaluation of good, difficult books and a complete disregard for why we read books in the first place. And I'd just like to preface this section by saying that I am in no way opposed to erotic fiction. In fact, some of my favorite literature and some of the most beautiful literature I have read has come from the erotic genre. It is most definitely possible for smut to be literate. And I think, for instance, Henry Miller is a perfect example of this. And if you can stomach it, I would say that the introduction to 120 Days of <clears throat> by the Marquis de Sade 
is beautiful literature. The rest of the book is absolute garbage. It's, it is terrible. It should, it's awful. Don't bother. The introduction, yes, but nothing else. Don't read any further. There's absolutely no point or value in doing that to yourself. I also remember reading Fanny Hill or Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure when I was about 16. And I had no idea what I was reading erotically just because there is so much euphemistic language used in the book. But I remember very vividly being so enchanted by the story of a 14 year old girl trying to survive as well as her moral and her personal growth from childhood into middle age. The smut was hot and heavy, but importantly, it didn't take away nor did it substitute good storytelling. I also very much appreciate the community side to smut talk. A lot of this is very community based, very much woman that is very young woman really liking to talk to one another about the books or specifically or only the chapters or the smut that they've read. I think because especially adult content, especially the watching of adult content is in no way geared toward women. This is a very viable and very understandable alternative, mainly because it is geared toward women. The smut is very romanticized. It is about emotions as opposed to what you see in adult content visually. So I just wanted to say that just before being called a puritanical who's just a prude or being called somebody who doesn't appreciate the values of smut talk. I can most definitely see that there is a value for many people in that, especially for young women understanding their sexuality and getting in touch with their sexual side. However, looking through smut talk and doing what many smut talkers do, which is just skim through the books, I can quite firmly say it becomes immediately clear that everybody reads the same books and reads them for the exact same reasons. It's trendy and you're reading it for the smut value. And I think importantly, the ability for the reader to put themselves into the position and the shoes of the protagonist. Sex sells souls and a reader is immediately gratified. You get that quick low effort dopamine release and can head over to TikTok to endlessly scroll about what you've just read. And in this era of reading, a reader is no longer considered a reader but a consumer. Now most popular smut is a never ending series and I mean that it is never ever ending. And for me it isn't just that these series are never ending. It's actually the fact that you do not even have to read these books in order, in order to understand what is going on. And for me personally, this is very telling of how poorly a book has not just been written, but how poorly the world and characters have been built. Another interesting development is that a great deal of popular smut is actually dictated by the readership. For instance, one popular smut talker said that readers and consumers openly ask authors to change their books covers and make them more discreet so that they can buy them and read them openly. And she says that this is something that she sees in the community happening weekly. A lot of smut talkers are TikTokers. And this is indicative of how many of these books are not written with the author thinking of the book, of its quality, of really developing and honing into its content, in as much as thinking primarily about what the mass readership wants, what they are demanding. And I cannot help but notice so many parallels in smut talk and how the business of the day works in this particular genre of mass-produced romance novels for especially young women and increasingly publishing and books in general in our modern society. Now to an extent a writer always has to think about their target readership but thinking of your target readership to the detriment of quality and your own personal flourishes especially when it comes to expressing your literary prowess is I think a a sign of a decline. A sign of a worrying decline when it comes to very popular modern literature. And it is so clear to me that modern smut does this by being able to completely disregard everything but the dialogue without readers therefore being unable to understand the story. How readers can understand what is going on by just skimming the books by dialogue is a mystery to me. It would be a mystery to me but 
but I have read, no, sorry, I've skimmed through quite a few of these books in the past few days, and it's obvious why. If you're able to skim or just read the dialogue, it is very telling that the dialogue that is provided is probably not just very poor, but is otherwise not adding to any crucial context to the meat and bones or what should be the meat and bones of a book. And this is because what the reader primarily wants is the ability to put themselves into the place of the protagonist. And the protagonists have to be relatable to such an extent that by default, they have to be devoid of quality, of exceptionality, of development and complexity. And I think this point of character development is something that I very much notice in a lot of these kinds of books. For instance, I cannot see myself in Edna Pontellier, Kate Chopin's protagonist in The Awakening, because her character, her struggles and her awakening are so intricately developed with Edna and only Edna, and especially to what she represents to Chopin. But I can most definitely see myself in the themes that arise from the quality of Edna's portrayal, such as the struggles between conforming to your duties or pursuing your passions, the time old conflicts between lust and love. And in, for instance, this book, I see a very important medium being balanced, a medium between finding a character relatable without devaluing that character and their development by the author. Now, when it comes to this discussion for me personally, there really doesn't seem to be that medium anymore. When it comes to all of these headlines about why people are not reading, specifically why people cannot read. There doesn't seem to be a medium between what the reader as consumer wants, that is escapism, easy plots, and characterless characters that we can put ourselves into, and what the reader as consumer needs. That is good, thought-provoking, and in my personal opinion, philosophical literature that crucially and necessarily has to have complex and difficult characters to understand, to empathize with, etc. And I do think that this discourse is too often divided between snotty elites who blame everything on the masses and on popular literature, as well as this idea that the masses and appealing to the masses is inherently an evil in and of itself. Where is the great American novel now? And believe you me, there are many examples contemporarily of the great American novel, of great literature. And on the other hand, between people who really see reading as an aesthetic or a consumptive activity. That is, they see themselves as consumers. They're very much a part of, I would say, an online community to discuss the literature or the books that they are reading and very much place particular demands on the author. Just like with how the internet has brought celebrities far closer to us, I think the same can most definitely be said for authors, which adds an extra layer of pressure onto them to cater to their readership. Franchises are a perfect perfect example of this. I personally think it's commendable and really an achievement and a very important thing that the masses are reading. However, there is a discussion into what the masses are reading, into what we are reading. Because at the same time, literacy rates are not universal. And the fact that those who are literate are choosing not to read or choosing increasingly to read popular literature that is not, in my opinion, very well written when it comes to the most popular literature literature and are also importantly not finding that literature either challenging to read or something that is really testing or challenging or cultivating critical thought, I think there is something a bit worrisome there. As well as a further explanation into why so many young people probably are not reading. There's just not good literature out there for them that sort of meets their needs. But I really would love to hear your thoughts on this. Is reading important to you and do you find or do you find yourself sort of a bit of an anomaly in this regard? Do you find that people are not reading as much or that literature, whether it be the classics or modern literature, is not valued as greatly by our society? I know where I stand on this and I also know that at the same time, I do see the positives, the real net positives in more and more people having access to literature that they can understand. But has this gone too far? And do you think, as some people predict, that books will be obsolete for young people. That is for the next generations. I sincerely hope not. That would be absolutely and utterly heartbreaking. But thank you so much for watching this video. I have to look after a kitten now. <laughs> 
Thank you so much to Trainwell for also sponsoring this video. And I'll see all of you very, very soon in the next one. I'm just not used to the fact that cats can jump and climb onto things like windowsills. It, it petrifies me because I'm a dog person and I see dogs. Dogs can't climb and it just, it freaks me out. It freaks me out. And she's just playing with the blinds happily, merrily. Um, I don't know what to do, you guys.